Can you hear me okay? All right. How are ya? Happy Labor Day weekend. I am so excited. I am so excited for you, but I'm also so excited for me because I've had the privilege of having her all week, not all week since Wednesday, but um, my friend Kelly Isola is here with you today and you are going to be so blessed. I've been blessed all week long. So, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad that you're making time for this this morning in your holiday weekend. And for those of you that are joining us online, welcome. We are so glad that you're with us. And as I tell you often, please put stuff in the chat because I go home and I read the chat. You know, my life is pretty simple. And so reading your chats is part of my life. So please put stuff in there. Uh, I also give you I also give you a weather update and it's kind of crazy right here now. Um, we've had yesterday was very overcast and very humid. Today is humid, not quite as bad as yesterday. Expecting to be in the 80s today with sun and then tomorrow back down in the 70s. I it's just crazy. And for those of you that are not local, the leaves are starting to turn. You get to see it as you're driving along, and it really is kind of like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> but anyway, it is what it is, and it is September 1st, and here we are. So let us begin as we do with our opening song. And remember, you can sit or stand, whatever is your pleasure. Come together as people of prayer. 
please be seated, and I invite you to join me in prayer. As we open up our hearts and our minds, we open up to this glorious day. Ah, to be walking this earth today. What a blessing that is. And to know that we are the very essence of love. And so wherever we walk today, we carry love and let it flow. I like to think of that as we're in this room to just let all the love that you are just pour out and it mingles with the love sitting next to you on your right and on your left, goes right out the door and down onto River Road. And then people hit that shield of love and they think, what just happened? Yeah, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for the fact that we know the truth of who we are and that we are walking embodiments of love. And so that love goes wherever it's needed. We don't need to direct it. It knows. So for that and so much more, and for the time that we spend here to get together today, we just give thanks. Thank you, God. Would you say that with me? Thank you, God. And so it is, and we let it be. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes, yes. So what do I want to tell you about? I want to tell you uh, what a joy it has been to have Kelly with me this week. Um, she broadens my perspective on things like it, it, it's mind-blowing. Um, so, And you're going to notice that. I'm, I have no doubt you're going to notice that. <laughs> but there's something else I want to tell you too. And it has nothing to do with Kelly, but it has to do with my little guy. You know, my little Zeroy? I think I might have told you that I washed my comforter and he wouldn't get back on the bed. And, and this, was, this was weeks ago. And now he's back on the bed. Ah, oh, so relieved. <laughs> so I now have his presence when I wake up in the morning and his little eyes are looking at me. And I love that. So, uh, just an update of what goes on in my world. You can see my world's pretty small. <laughs> uh, so, let us begin as we do with our, uh, our uh, statement, our um, whatever it's called, invocation. <laughs> Are we ready? Yes. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life. God, the good, omnipotent. One presence, one power operating in our life. And our vision statement is, centered in divine love, we celebrate a spiritually transformed world. And I remind you every week that that transformed world is an inner job, not an outer job. As we transform, as we see things from a different perspective, as we open up to the love that we are, then we see it wherever we go. Our mission statement is, Unity Center for Spiritual Growth reaches in to reach out through education, service, and creation of community. And again, I tell you, each week we are living our mission. You are here every Sunday receiving some education, whether it's from me, from Kelly, or each other. And we're in service because whether you're doing something as the music team or the AV people or hospitality, you are in service because you're here. You are here serving one another. And then, of course, the community is what we create together. And our core values, these are the values that we hold as a community, and they are we are loving, we are accepting, we are authentic, we are transformative, we are soul-centric, we are compassionate, and we are welcoming. And that is the truth about us. And now our community song is? Community song is, this is a song that was, can you hear me in the system? Yeah. Maybe, can you turn, Scott, could you turn up, uh, this is Mike, no. Do what do you want me to do? One. I'm talking to Scott. Oh, you're talking to Scott. <laughs> talking okay. to Scott. If you can just turn up mic number one a little bit. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be on the quiet side today. I've got a cold. I don't have very much power. 
Uh, but anyway, as I was saying, Kelly comes to us not only with a talk, but she had a bunch of song suggestions, and they were great suggestions, and this is one of them. This is a song by Marcy, Marcy Baruch, The Strength of Love. Here it is. Choir and I are going to sing through the first verse for you, and then we're going to do the whole song together. from the strength of love I am born from born from the strength of love all that I am today all that I bring today I know that it's enough oh I am born from born from the strength of love Sounds like you already know this song. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, we're going to do the whole thing for real. First verse. I am born from, born from the strength of love. I am born from, born from the strength of love. All that I am today, all that I bring today, I know that it enough. Oh, I am born from, born from the strength of love. I am breathing, breathing the strength of love. I am breathing, breathing the strength of love. holy air. Every thought is a prayer. May we be lifted up. Oh, I am breathing, breathing the strength of love. I am blessing, blessing the strength strength of love. I bring it forth today, sending it on its way out to the hills above. Oh, I am blessing, blessing the strength of love. I am blessing, I Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was beautiful. Another new song. Ah, I love it. I love it. And even though you said you have a cold, yeah. you came through. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> you came through okay. All right. So that now is the time that we welcome each other. And as I look around the room, I see many, many familiar faces. So I am really grateful that you're all here with us. And if you are with us for the very first time online, please put your name in the chat and let us know where you're coming to us from. The folks online will be happy to welcome you just as we're going to be welcoming people here. So the way that we do that is through uh, singing Namaste through once, and then the second time through, we sing it and greet one another with a smile, with a nod. And you know the 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 eye thing. That that's that's what cats do when they're greeting one another. <laughs> so let's do it. Let's do it to it. Namaste.
you. And now is the time that I share with you our five basic principles. And I do this every week because they go in your spiritual toolbox. And I'm sure there are times throughout the week where you are needing to call on one, two, three, four, or five of them. And the first one is that God is good and everywhere present. And remember, we know that there is not a God out there. It's a God that resides within each of us. So wherever we are, God is. The second one is that everybody is whole and complete. Everybody has that same spark of divinity within them that Jesus had. And that when we're seeing things that are showing up in our life and we're thinking, I can't find that wholeness in that person, that's when we have to shift how we're seeing it. Because they're showing up as who they're not but we know the difference. The third one is that our thoughts are creative. And as we think a thought, it creates the next thought, and it creates the next thought, and then we embody it, and we put our feeling to it, and it's very likely going to show up in our life. The fourth one is prayer and meditation is that cornerstone to all of these. So when you have a practice of prayer and meditation on a regular basis, you're much more likely to remember that you have these tools. But I'll tell you, and I've been using these tools now for 30 years or more, I still get down the rabbit hole before I remember I have these in my toolbox. I can get there so quickly. It doesn't even, I mean, it's like this. And then I'm feeling that anxiety and that stress and all. And I think, have you prayed about it, Pat? Uh, No. So uh, just know, and that's the fifth one, putting them into action. How do we put them into action in our world, in our daily life? And so who has a story that you'd like to share of how you put them in action? Gloria, come on down. Nice to see you, my dear. Um, this is a happy story, and it incorporates your saying, you have been blessed this week. Okay. And so this is a blessing, among others. Um, I happen to be grocery shopping, and in the lot, and this gentleman and this woman, they were collecting carts. And the gentleman said to me, would you care for a cart? And I said, thank you. I said, I'm soon going to be 94. Because people keep telling me I don't look it, so I don't know how I'm supposed to look. (laughs) That's a blessing right there, really, for all of us. I'm thinking of that route at the top of my head. And I said, you know, there are things I can do myself. But I'm learning that when someone says to me, would you care for this? Would you care for that? Would you care to do this? I say, thank you. And so I'm learning that because I've been relatively independent during my life, you know? Uh, and, but not to, I don't think to a fault. I don't think to a fault. It's just accustomed to doing things and on my own. I grew up alone and had half-sisters and brothers, but they were long gone when I was born. So anyway, that, and uh, it, that wasn't just the other day. Oh, so I came into the store, and the woman presented me with a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> this is, see, I would have forgotten. And so anyway, I'm toddling around doing my grocery shopping, and the man caught up with me, and brought me a bouquet of flowers. So I'm, I'm just saying that it wasn't about me primarily. It was that maybe they were touched. Maybe, what is it like to collect shopping carts? You know, who cares? And you don't know if you're going to get run over or not by somebody <laughs> pulling out and what have you. So that's, that's my message for today. I love it. (laughs) 
so the message I take away from that is say yes when somebody wants to help you and say thank you, yes, thank you, you can help me. Because that is then giving somebody else the opportunity to serve. Yeah, one more. Anybody else got something you want to say? Yeah, Callie, come on down. Absolutely. Uh, she is more than that. <laughs> Hi, everybody. How are we today? So this is a follow-up message from last week. The goal last week was to get all the imprint back on the labyrinth so we rock collectors could take a moment to get back on the labyrinth and pick up the heart stones and bring them to their new home, which is a new pathway in our new face-lifted labyrinth. So today's the day. We have a potluck, and the invitation is, it's ready, it's waiting for all of you. Come join me. I'm going out there after today's service to start moving more of the heart stones back into the face of the labyrinth. So your invitation is there. Come on and join me. <laughs> the other piece I wanted to throw out there to you, too, was I, I was compelled. I was compelled to step into phase two of the labyrinth um, renovation, and... Uh, I uh, asked a couple of friends in the community here, Janice and Jim, to come join me yesterday. And um, we're putting in um, what I'm calling, no one else necessarily calls it this, but uh, the labyrinth uh, memory hedge. And so when you go up onto the labyrinth platform up there, there's a new um, outer circle that's forming of uh, arbor vitae hedges that will be our sound barrier to the traffic, but it will be a beautification um, to enhance the grounds up there in more of a sanctified way. So uh, we're, I'm, I'm putting out the call. I invested my blood, my sweat, and tears. Well, Jim invested his blood yesterday uh, up there. No. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, I'm, I'm putting out an invitation uh, for donations for the hedges and the renovations and just asking if you would like it to be in a memory or a memorial for somebody. We can uh, uh, accommodate that for you, but I think it's a great new um, multi-faced lifted uh, project, so thank you. You know when you know that somebody is in the right on the right seat on the bus. And Kelly is certainly on the right seat on the bus when it comes to the labyrinth. Her vision, her execution, her enrollment, it's all there. She has, and her passion, you can feel her passion when she talks about it. And the little piece that you need to know is that Kelly was here and the project manager when the first labyrinth got c constructed. So it's very rare that you have somebody that was here at the beginning. Um, you know, I, I, well, I can, I can attest to that. I was at the beginning of this building. I was here when, it, when I walked through it, and it was nothing but one long building, cinder block, smoke-filled, black, because it had been a dance hall and a bottle club. And everybody was saying, oh my gosh, this can be so beautiful. And I'm thinking, what are they seeing? Because <laughs> I certainly couldn't see it. Uh, but <laughs> it has, yes, so we see the transformation. And so Callie, having been here in the beginning, has the vision and the history and the continuing to honor those who were here before. So. Yes, I think you're right on that. And you know what? Great minds run in the same channel because I was thinking that exact same thing earlier today. So I will reach out to the uh, Wyndham Eagle and see what we can do. Thank you, Gloria. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So our daily word reader is Laurie Stabler. Good morning, Laurie. Yes. Oh, I love the, sh the pattern in your sh uh, skirt. Thank you. 
And the daily word, whoops, I forget. You got to do this. The daily word today is togetherness. Togetherness enriches my soul. So much of modern life involves time alone and solitary effort. The more conveniences I acquire, the less time I may seem to have. When I find myself spending too much time alone, it's good for me to invest time and effort in my relationships. Togetherness is a way to remember life is about more than work and busyness, and I am part of something greater than myself. Time spent with others blesses and enriches me. It calls me to share of myself and remain open to others' journeys and ways of looking at life I may not have considered. Togetherness is a balm for my soul, a way to feel the presence of God reflected in those with whom I share this wonderful planet. I am part of the wondrous human family, and I celebrate our togetherness. And the quote is, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another, from Romans 12.5. Thank you so much. And now we'll turn it over to Dina. Oh, before we turn it over to you, Dina, let me do the intro to, to Callie. Um, <clears throat> I said to her, uh, not Callie, Kelly. Uh, sorry. I said to her on the way down, what do you want me to tell them about you? <laughs> and she said, whatever you want. Um, and, and I say that because her resume is long. Uh, but the things that I want to say about Callie that are, are near and dear to me is her mind is one like I've never seen before. And she can look at something from a way and help you to see it from a different point of view. And the conversations that we've been having this week are just amazing. So because of that um, and, and her um, ability to communicate, she is an excellent teacher. She teaches whenever the opportunity arises. She just finished teaching a graduate course at one of the, um, uh, what, what, Joni Coleman? Jo yeah, Johnny Coleman Theological um, Institute. She is a, an amazing, and, and something else that she does, she doesn't have her own ministries per se. So what she tells us, I go out and do the research I look at what the trends are. You don't have time to do that. I tell you. And that is so helpful. That is so helpful because she can read situations so amazing. The other thing that is so amazing about her is her depth of knowledge about the Fillmores. She goes into the archives and she digs. And so again, we have a, a call on Thursday mornings and it's all ministers, and there's usually 25 or so of us. And she'll, last week, just put in a quote from Myrtle. And then everybody looks at that quote, and what does it mean? And, and we have a conversation about it. So she's teaching us every single week, as well as other people. So uh, you're in for a, an amazing morning, and I'm not, I'm, I'm this is not, this is not just making this up. You're going to see it. And she's also going to be teaching here on Tuesday evening a class on Myrtle Fillmore's healing practices. So from 6.30 to 8. So you probably want to make sure you're here for that. Okay. Now I'll turn it over to Dina. And when she's done, Kelly, you just come, um, Kelly, you just come up and, and stop. So to open up Kelly's talk, this is, uh, this is another one of Kelly's song suggestions. This is a song by Denise Rozier, Between Us. Love is alive in the space between us. Feel that love right now. God speaks out in the words between us. Hear those words right now. I am holy. You are holy. There is peace.
between us. Spirit shines in the light between us. See that light right now. Peace is born in the good between us. Be that peace right now. I am a holy. You are a holy. There's beauty between. I'm so I'm so loud. I'm like, do I need a mic? I know. Oh, online, the people in the balcony. Good to see you. And I'm Italian. But the, the, that space between us, we have a lot of conversation and we talk a lot about this oneness thing. And, you know, we're not separate. Yet we are. I can see space between us, not separate in the in the sense that, you know, we're we're one in consciousness. Okay, we're one in consciousness. In my human condition, in my human, wonderfully glorified human, fully human, fully divine, in my humanity, we are separate. Thank goodness, because I can see your face. Right? I can experience faith between us. That's why I wanted the song. So we can exp I can experience love between us. You know, uh, Pat goes through, so there's a, cover your ears. Um, there, Cause there's a couple things I'm gonna say that, you know, but it's not the first time. We spend a lot of time in Thursday morning meetings. Um, but so earlier and every week, Reverend Pat goes through the five principles. I happen to think there's one principle four practices. There's one principle, meaning there's one presence and one power, period, end of discussion. And then there's four practices. How do I bring that into my world? Well, the second one is to recognize I'm it, right? That I'm fully human, I'm fully divine. My divine identity is divine, God, 
principle and not just a spark. Sorry, got to go away from the spark thing. But not just a spark, but all of me is fully human and fully divine. So that's my, my divine nature. My divine identity is what shows up moment to moment, choice by choice. Right? My divine identity is, so it looks a little different in any given moment. If you cross my path on the wrong moment, on the wrong day, my divine identity is going to look a little different than if I was, like, centered in that moment. <laughs> right? It doesn't, it's never, I'm never not my divine identity. It's just, what does it look like? Right? And our consciousness informs that. So that's, so our divine identity is moment to moment, choice by choice, all day, every day. So that's how I, so those four things is, so the second one is I'm fully human, I'm fully divine, my divine nature, my divine identity. Then the third one is our thoughts and feelings. Science is showing us that our thoughts were actually, feelings come first. We used to been, we've learned a lot in unity that feelings come from our thoughts. Well, guess what? Not usually. We're Feeling creatures who think. We're feeling creatures who think. Now, there are, of course, emotions and feelings that come from thoughts, but it's we create our world through our thought feelings. It's like one thing. You can't escape them. Um, and then our prayer and meditation. And your divine, the, your divine identity will show you from what place you pray. Like we all have, our divine nature is the same for all of us. Our divine identity, moment to moment, choice by choice. So my prayer is going to look a little different. And then the fifth one is get up off your affirmations and do something. <laughs> right? And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start following Gloria around the supermarket. Because I've never gotten flowers at the supermarket, so i got to follow you around, and maybe somebody will you'll zip by them too fast, and they'll need to put them in my basket. Yeah. So I have a... Oh, the one last thing, the one last heretical thing I have to say is that uh, if you have a phone, I encourage you to turn it on put it in stun mode or meditation mode, but turn it on because I'm going to say something that you want to post. I'm going to say something that you want to write down, take a note about. You want to go to this church's Facebook page and connect with those that are online, right? So I know some people are like, you can't have your phone on in church. Yes, you can. You're allowed to. Although I will tell you that one time I, a church um, actually banned me from public speaking. I'm not making this up. It's a church that's not too far from where I live. Uh, I live close to Unity Village. Uh, and I sat, after I spoke, I sat down. And what I do is I go, I go to the church's Facebook page where people are, are watching live. And I, make, I want them to know I'm there, that I'm listening, that I'm watching in the moment. And I take notes for myself. Like what I liked or what, I, oh, I missed that or, oh, that was really good. But somebody sitting behind me decided I was playing games on my phone. So went to the board to tell them and the board said, we won't be inviting you back ever again. I said, okay, your loss. <laughs> so. so I want to tell you a story. Once upon a time in, I did say turn your phone on, didn't I? And I forgot to say turn the volume down. You know, even if you put it in silence mode, it doesn't turn the volume down if you go to somewhere else and there's a video playing. But it's okay. It's, we work with it. Right? Isn't that church? We just work with it. And ever have any speed bumps? Things go awry. This isn't what I planned. This isn't what I wanted. That never happens here, right? <laughs> we go with it. Right. So my story, once upon a time, there was in a not so far away land, there was this kingdom of acorns. And this kingdom of acorns lived at the base of a big old oak tree. 
and they were um, uh, they were modern, fully westernized acorns. So they went to workshops and um, classes to for their health and their well-being, um, and they went about their business. They're also, you know, baby boomer acorns. So they went about their business with much purposeful energy, um, and a lot of a lot of those courses and classes were self-help courses. So how do I how do you get the most out of your um, your shell? Right? Um, what, you know, how do you work with your nutty story? You know, so the, all these self help um, classes. And there were woundedness and recovery groups for acorns that had, you know, from their initial fall from the tree. So classes to go, go for healing and whatnot. And um, there were spas for oiling. You know, can, I, can you imagine an acorn with a sort of a towel or something kind of going? you know, oiling their, their shell, you know, and a lot of acornopathic remedies um, because they were good, you know, baby boomer, fully westernized acorns. Well, one day an acorn shows up amidst them that didn't have a cap. He was kind of dull and dirty and um, immediate negative impression on everybody else, you know, clearly did not fit in. And um, they, so they asked him like, what, what are you doing here? Where did you come from? And he, um, he said, well, uh, I'm not really sure, like I fell here, but, um, you know, they said, well, who are you? And he looked up at the tree and he goes, we're that. He points up at the tree and he says, we are that. And the other acorns go, oh, he's insane. He's delusional. You know, he hasn't been to enough acornopathic remedy classes yet. And, so, and they, and, but one of them, and most of them kind of turn and go away, but one of them keeps talking about it. You know, what do you mean we are that? And the, this dirty little oddball acorn says, well, I'm not really sure, but it has something to do with the gr going into the ground and breaking open. And the other ac or acorn guy says, yeah, now, now I know you're delusional. Because if you did that, then you wouldn't be an acorn anymore. Yeah. Mm hmm. So my talk title is Step, Step, Heal. Step, Step, Heal. And I call it that because I am going to talk about Myrtle Fillmore and I am going to talk about her, um, her, you know, if you read enough Myrtle Fillmore, you find that there's, you know, seven steps to this, five steps to a more glorious that, three step. you know, I am not, a, when I see an ad on social media or the TV that tells me seven steps to greater prosperity, click, anything that tells me there's this many steps, I tend to be a little skeptical. It doesn't mean I don't, it doesn't mean I'll necessarily ignore it, but um, I, I got to dive a little deeper because for me, it makes it sound like there's a destination to get to rather than being on this journey. And I think that's one of the, the pitfalls in new thought is that everything is got to get there, right? You got to just like the baby boomer acorns, got to go to all these, you know, oiling my spa class or oiling my acorn class and, you know, the woundedness and recovery classes because I'm working to get somewhere. We were, Pat and I were just talking about this the other day, that I don't ever use the words ascended or enlightenment because it's a destination. It's that you never get to. I mean, maybe someday, I shouldn't say never, but I, I'm more interested in what's right here. Like what's going on right here? And I, I think that uh, to focus on somewhere down the road, some imaginable, uh, you know, an uh, imagined place or enlightenment keeps me away from right here and right now, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? Who wants to be uncomfortable? Of course not. But guess what? You get to be. It's called living this life, right? So I want to read you a little bit from, um, uh, from Myrtle Fillmore. It comes out of Healing, healing Letters. There's two books about who, was I, I was just talking about this before, service. There's two books on Myrtle Fillmore. One is called How to Let God Help You, which is a collection of a couple of lessons 
that she did, um, and then letters that she wrote. The other book is called Myrtle Fillmore Healing Letters, and those are just all letters that Myrtle wrote. Unfortunately, those, when you read the letters, it's Myrtle's response to someone. You'd never see what the person wrote. So it's like reading somebody's mail. Because all you get to see is what Myrtle said to the person, which it has to contain some measure of context or response to what the person wrote, right? But we don't get to see that. So what's happened over the last 130 years is this single story of Myrtle Fillmore, which is incomplete at best. So fortunately for me, because I live so close to Unity Village, I've spent years wandering into the archives. Like I go into the archives, I pull a box out, I put a whole bunch of letters on a table, take the phone, click, 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 right? So I get to read all these letters that, um, that I get to see the letter that someone wrote in, and then I get to see what she said. And, that's, and that has allowed me to really kind of expand, like, oh, this woman was really, there's a whole lot more to this woman. Like, everybody believes that she did this, healed herself of uh, typhoid and uh, tuberculosis and typhoid, tuberculosis in two years, um, and it's just, that's a good cultural myth. There's actually no evidence she had tuberculosis. She had tubercular conditions and symptoms, right? But if you, if you put, if you read all of her stuff and everything she says about herself, what she did was, and you look at all the symptoms, today, like some of the symptoms are very clearly, oh, she had irritable bowel syndrome. Oh, she had anxiety. Oh, she had migraine headaches. Oh, she had asthma. Oh, she, you know, but 150 years ago, 160 years ago, when you didn't know what it was, they got all lumped together and somebody said, you have tubercular conditions because there wasn't a, a thing for it. Now, uh, anybody that, that is fully committed to healed herself in two years from tuberculosis, great. I'm not here to completely destroy you know, what you're standing on. But I tell you that because there's a whole lot more to Myrtle Fillmore, to healing, than what we have been generally hear and learn you know, in our churches. So as part of that, what I discovered was, um, you know, coming back to this three steps, seven steps, five steps, whatever, is there's one of, at one of the letters, there's, she talks about a two-step. There's a, this two-step process to healing. So I want to read you a little bit from the letter. Um, as I, so, and just FYI, any vocal intonation is me because obviously I can't hear Myrtle's voice in a letter, but it's what I like to think. Having read so much about her, she did not play small. She did not mess around. There are letters where she tells people, stop writing us because you're not willing to do what you need to do, so we're not going to read your letters anymore. Like, don't write us again. What we would say today is, don't call us, we'll call you. Um, and she does. She says it directly. She's not like, overly rude or anything, but she's very clear. Are you doing this? Are you doing that? If you're not, okay, then go do it and then get back to me, you know, kind of thing. And she, you know, she just, she's not this, she's not a, if anybody thinks she's like this sweet kind of grandmother, kumbaya, yeah, no. <laughs> not even remotely. So here's what she, so someone writes a letter to her, which don't have, but this is what she says. As I read your letter, two of your statements prompt me to give a little explanation before giving the outline for treatments to your requests. So she called prayer spiritual mind treatments. Okay? And obviously the person has made a request. First you write, I'm wondering if you will send, not just to me, but also to my brother, some health vibrations. The second thing you write is, we are also asking you to relieve us through the silent unity healing. So the silent unity healing is, you know, people in silent unity praying. She goes on to say, I'm not sure that you understand that you are to cooperate with us, 
by studying the truth so that you may come into the understanding of the divine laws of health and life and prosperity and by joining us in daily prayers. And I'm like, okay. So I'm not sure you get it that you have to do some work too. You don't just ask us, right? Then she goes on, we will not say that the work we do here has nothing to do with healing, but we do not promise results unless we have the faith and cooperation of those for whom we pray and to whom we give instruction. Seems pretty clear. If you cooperate with us, something might happen. If not, here's your hat. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. And then she says, after all, it is not the physical and mental relief that means most to the persons receiving treatment. Did you hear that? It's not the results, you know, or the relief. We are not so much concerned with the results as we are with the growth in consciousness that will make the results abiding. We're not, uh, we're not so much concerned with the results as we are with the growth in consciousness that will make the results abiding. So in, in there, um, and a little bit further down where I took that from, she says that healing is a two-step process. One, to believe. Two, to be open and receptive to the stream of healing life. So whenever I talk about this in class or like in this context, if I say believe, are you believing, and based on what she says, as she writes it, are you believing in outcome or are you believing in process? Are you believing in outcome or are you believing in process? So, not a rhetorical question, which one do you think? Process. Yeah, it starts to get like kind of, oh. It's sort of like asking, which is more important, inhaling or exhaling? <laughs> are you believing in process or are you believing in outcome? I, I, somebody over here said both, I think, right? I thought I heard it. So that's the, okay. Both, yeah. Uh, so I, I tend to go more down the process road though. Um, and I don't exclude believing in outcome. Um, and I know that the outcome is determined by my process, right? But it doesn't mean I can't hold the idea of outcome, right? Remember, remember our divine nature? So then the next part is um, being open and receptive to the stream of healing life. So another not rhetorical question. What's the stream? What's in that stream of healing life? Love, compassion, Y'all are waiting for me to say the right answer, aren't you? <laughs> Everybody, somebody actually already said it. Everything. Our joys and our sufferings are our wholeness. Let me say that again for you. Our joys and our sufferings are our wholeness. Anybody have something happen to them that they wished they hadn't? So that's part of that stream of healing life, right? If God is everywhere present, if there's one presence and one power active in my life, then there's one presence and one power active always everywhere, which means that in my suffering, there is God. It's not that God makes the suffering, but we have suffering in life, right? We have pain, we have discomfort, we have grief, we have loss, we have annoying people. Right? You're the people that are most irritating and annoying in your life. Anybody have one? <laughs> if you don't, I can give you one of mine. <laughs> but those people are your master teachers. They are your master teachers because they, they call us to go, oh, crap. 
right? And recognize that, okay, I'm out of my lane. My bubble's off center. I've forgotten my divine nature and therefore my divine identity moment to moment, choice by choice, is showing up a little differently. So Myrtle says, being open and receptive to the stream of healing life. That's everything. Everything is for me. When I say everything is for me, it doesn't mean it feels comfortable. I don't look at things or emotions in life as good or bad, right or wrong, positive, negative. It just is. And I get to see and discern and learn, okay, yeah, where did that come from, right? Oh, yeah, me. So everything, everything. And then the, the so I, there's a, most of, I think most people know the parable of the mustard seed, right? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that when planted, a big tree grew to take care of the birds. That's Kelly's paraphrase from Luke. Um, most of us know that. But 600 years before that, Buddha has a parable of the mustard seed. Did you know that? Yeah. So there's an earlier parable of a mustard seed. And how it goes is there's this woman who's uh, got a young toddler son who's, who's very sick and he's died. And she's obviously bereft. Right. And she's she goes around her whole village and, you know, help me, help me heal my son. I want my son back. You have to help me heal my son. How do I do this? And everyone says to her, well, you need to go see Buddha. So she goes, she takes her son and she goes to find Buddha. She gets to Buddha and Buddha says, OK, go back to your village, knock on every door and ask each person for a handful of mustard seed. Ask them if they have not been touched by death to give you a handful of mustard seed. And she's, you know, probably like us, is like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> but she does. She goes back to her village and she starts knocking on doors, you know, still obviously in her grief and really, you know, I'm not sure what I'm doing, but this is what I was told to do. So she knocks on every door and says, if you've not been touched by death, please give me a handful of mustard seed. So as she goes through the whole village doing this, how much mustard seed do you think she collected? None. Exactly. None. So what does, she, what does she get from that? She's not alone. Yeah. Yeah. Healing is a communal thing. Right? Healing is that being open to that stream of life. Everything. So she's open to the stream of life of her dead child and yet discovers that everyone around her has been touched by death. Every, this common humanity. And you don't do it alone. Right? What time am I supposed to stop now? <laughs> and she said in the car driving over, just make sure you're done by, and I don't remember what that was. Oh, okay, so just a couple minutes. So I have one, another, uh, I want to use a piece of scripture that's one of my favorites. And that's the, the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda, right? The paralytic, he's been paralyzed, unable to walk for 38 years or something. And it's one of those, the, the writer of the gospel has Jesus commanding him to get up and walk, take your mat and walk. And um, I'm always fascinated by this because it's a healing story, right? And I'm always fascinated by... Um, okay, so, like, why do I care? It's a story that's 2,000 years old. What does this have to do with me? And I realized one day that what it has to do with me is there's a whole lot about the story that we don't know about that I can make up, you know, just like the gospel writers did. <laughs> but I can, can um, so I look at the story and here's this man, he's been paralyzed, not able to walk for 38 years, and he's at this pool of Bethesda. Now, if you're not familiar with what that is, it's the, it was this huge portico that was beautiful, and the architecture was just, you know, it was a beautiful, magnificent place, and there was this pool in the middle of it. And when the angels came along, they would enter the water, and the water would bubble up. That's how you knew the angels were present. So when the water bubbles up, the first one in the water gets healed. That's how this works. If you're a paralytic 
what are the chances that you're going to be first in the water? Not likely. So for 38 years, you know, but every time the water bubbles up, you know the angels are there, and it's your time for healing. So he tries to go, but obviously he's not. So then the way the story's written, Jesus comes along and says, and asks him, you know, do you want to be healed? Well, who's going to say no? Right? So he says yes, and, and the writer of the story says, has Jesus say, well, pick up your mat and walk. And so he does. And that's kind of like the end of the story there. However, we tend to confuse healing and curing. So think about for a moment. What do you think this guy's life was like for 38 years being a paralytic? Think he was married? Had children? Had some kind of trade? What? Yeah, dependent and then some. Right? What did he eat? When did he eat? Taking care of his physical needs? I mean, think about everything in your life. So when Jesus says, do you want to be healed, and he says yes, what's going to change about his life? Everything. 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 So I think, for me, Myrtle's saying the same thing. I'm not sure you understand that you need to cooperate in order for you know, what you're asking for. So that's the question when I'm believing in process or believing in outcome, being open to the uh, healing stream of life, everything. So when I'm in my place of, you know, healing, it's a journey. It's not a destination because I'm always, it's always unfolding, always. Because I don't know about you, but my stream of healing life is always changing. And it's all for me. But what I hold, right, am I believing in process? Am I believing in outcome? Myrtle says, well, you know, you have things you have to do too. Um, and it's not necessarily about the results, but the, res but the change in consciousness that will make the results abiding. So what I'm holding is possibility. I don't even say infinite possibility. I think infinite and eternal should be thrown out of our vocabulary because the brain can't even wrap itself around those words. So I say I hold the possibility. It still leaves wide open for anything. I hold the possibility. Okay. Let's just take a minute to take it into meditation, short, to just contemplate on the idea I hold the possibility. Feel the words resonate. I hold the possibility. Being open to the stream of healing life, I open to possibility. When you hear those words, I open to possibility. When you hear the words, I hold the possibility. Where do you feel it in your body? Do you feel it in your chest, in your knees, in your back? We'll just be still for a moment. And just scan your body. Where do you feel a possibility? And part of that possibility is the invitation, do I want to be healed? Am I willing to surrender? And surrender is an inner opening, not an outer capitulation. Surrender is an inner opening. So 
So am I willing to surrender to this possibility knowing that everything can change? Everything. I hold the possibility. And so it is, and so it is. Amen. Do we have it for Kelly? Yes. <laughs> Did I disappoint you? No. No way. No way. So this just reminds you, be back here on Tuesday at 630 for more of Kelly. And our prayer partner today is Carolyn. Carolyn will be happy to pray with you at the conclusion of the service. I bet this stirred up a lot in you. Um, <laughs> also, uh, we heard about the blessings of, and meet Callie at the labyrinth after potluck. So grab your food. Don't spend a whole lot of time conversing so you can get out to the labyrinth. Um, Healing service will be happening in here at around 1145-ish. And that they'll, they'll let you know. They'll let you know when they're ready. Um, and then again, I remember, I remind you that um, Kelly will be doing the Tuesday night Myrtle Phil Fillmore Healing Circle. And that starts at 630. World Day of Prayer follows up. Um, next week with the prayer partners on September 12th at 6.30 to 8. So uh, they will be here and we hope that you will be joining us. Uh, Conscious Creatives will be back on September 19th from 6 to 8. This is the group that um, Mary leads and it's um, been on hiatus for the summer, but it will be back. Autumn Equinox Awakening with Vanessa Gates Elston on Zoom on Friday at 6.30 to 8 uh, on um, September 20th. And there are other things. Today is the last day to register for the early bird for uh, the women's retreat. So if you haven't already registered, uh, get your deposit in today. And that guarantees you the rate of 325 and it will go up to 350 starting tomorrow. So make sure you get yourself registered today if you haven't already. We have a, a great group of people already registered and we're waiting for you. So here's the time that, and of course, always look in the hot thoughts and on our website for changes because things are happening rapidly. I got a text from Todd last yesterday with like four things. Can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? So um, start looking for things coming from Todd as well. All right. Shifting gears one more time. Whew, take a breath. So which is more important, inhaling or exhaling? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> And this is a time that we, we uh, experience and, and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Exhibit, not that exhibit isn't the word I want, but um, 
express our generosity. That's the word that I'm looking for. Here's the time that we express our generosity. And because of your generosity, you keep this place moving. So other people who haven't made it through the doors or online find their way to us. And so let us say together our offering statement. Here we go. Divine love flowing through me blesses you. And remember, you come down and leave your offering in the bowl and take an affirmation. While the offering is being taken, please join us in singing, God is praise, praise, praise. God is the light within us. Praise, praise, praise. God is the love between us. Praise, praise, praise. God is the power that lifts us. Praise, praise, praise. God is the life that lives us. Praise, praise, praise. We I need to go to the potluck. I feel so full right now. Oh, my wordy. Yes. And we give thanks for these tithes and offerings as they go forth to do the will and the work here at Unity Center for Spiritual Growth. And so it is. Amen. And now let us end with a peace song. there be peace on earth and let it begin with me let there be peace on earth the peace that was meant to be Let this 
this be the moment now with every step i take let this be my joyous vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace Let us say our version of the prayer for protection. We are the light. We are the love. We are the power. We are the presence. Wherever we are, God is and all is swell. Have a blessed week, my friends. Stay for potluck. Go to the labyrinth. Come on Tuesday night. <laughs>